Good morning, everyone. Hello. How many of you are familiar with Chongqi Sutta? Some of you. Yeah, some of you. Most of you have... How many of you have never heard of it? Never heard of it? Serious? <laughs> I suspect many of you have not heard of it. But you're too shy. You're too shy. <laughs> Chongqi is the name of a person. Chanki is the name of a Brahmin. And this sutta is found in the middle length saying of the Buddha. It's Majitma Nikaya, middle length. So the Buddha's guidance, instructions, suttas uh, are collected into various volumes. Some long, so we call them long. Diga Nikaya is long. Some short. And the short ones have different names. And this one, Majima, M N means Majima, middle length saying. Okay. And middle length sayings, uh, that particular collections about this thing, if you buy the hard copy, but of course you can get them for free from Sutta Central. And Majima Nikaya has, for those of you who are very keen on meditation, if you really want to understand the key teachings of the Buddha. You can find them everywhere in Majjhima Nikaya. Uh, not easy to read. Not easy to read. But once it begins to make sense, you will have a Dhamma feast. It's like a Dhamma buffet. You know? Everything is there. And it's the Michelin star version. Really beautiful suttas. Today, we're going to talk about Chanki. Now, I chose this sutta. Wait. Ah. I chose this sutta actually because I have a certain assumption. I have a certain assumption about the BDMS participants congregation. They usually are the sutta type. You know, these are the intellectuals, the ones who examine suttas. And they, they dissect. And I'm very sure, I'm very sure, Julian, you have done this with others before. Yeah. Um, I then noticed today is a little different. We have more different, varied types of people. And then I decide, I think I better go slower. This sutta is not easy. But once you understand, it's really beautiful. It's spectacular. It talks about the way one arrives at an understanding of, an, of the Dhamma. It's enlightenment. It's the Buddha describing the enlightenment. But it's the first, first time you see it. It's the first eye opener. Not the final one. The okay, final one also uh, along the same line, but it's not that one. It is how you get there. And I thought it would be useful for people to have that understanding as it was explained by Buddha. Not your suka suka anyhow talk type. It's the way the Buddha explained it. Okay. I also like this sutta because it gives us a glimpse of the Buddha's world. Bhante Dhammika is very good at that. And, and for those of you who have not collected his book, Footprints in the Dust, please take it. It's one of the best. In fact, it is the best book. The best book written on the world of the Buddha and the Buddha's life. So anyhow, this sutta gives you a glimpse as to what they value in terms of how they judge people. How they judge people. Now, how do you judge people? You tell me. Don't tell me you don't judge. I don't believe. Behavior, oh, you are so well practiced. Because typically, the world judges by appearance, good looking, not good looking. They say, oh, I'm not so superficial. I don't believe you. We are that superficial. Most time, gorgeous looking fellas gets a second glimpse. And it's scientifically proven, huh? 
it's scientifically pro- I mean, as in they've done statistics and all, and it shows that really good fella, good looking fellas get faster promotion. But yeah. And wealth, right? Wealth. You say don't have God. Otherwise, why would people buy fast car? Big car. Because they believe that it catches attention. So wealth, looks, fame. In Singapore, degree. All those professional degrees. You don't tell me don't have. I tell you have. Okay? Because I've heard people going, wow, graduate also behave like that. They're not the same. Huh? One is about how well they memorize things and how well they deliver an exam and behavior. It's about character. It's a two different thing. But character matters. Okay? So, and here you catch a glimpse of what mattered to them. Okay, this is the conventional Brahmana definition of what is high social standing. Okay? This is the conventional one. Birth. We don't really care for that. In our society, Singapore, if this is not Singapore, this is somewhere else, there will be value put on that. Singapore doesn't care. But here it says, well-born on both sides, your lineage, seven generations. Okay, nobody goes around counting seven generations. Lah. But long enough and everybody is pleased. Okay? For them, Education is about how well you know the Vedas, the religious script. So you know from this that in that society, being educated means you are you have the you have you have a, a, the Vedas. You under, you know the Vedas and you can chant it. So these are all the I mean look grammar. No, we don't care, but they care. Philology, his stories, and so, th- so on and so forth. Looks not different from us. Handsome, graceful, possessing supreme beauty of complexion, sublime beauty and presence, remarkable to behold. Me see already very short. Sure. Just put it bluntly. Okay, you feel really good looking, okay? Ah, number four. This is in order of importance. Huh? For them, huh? I'm telling you, this is order of importance for them. This is how they, they look. Oh, what kind of lineage do you have? What sort of parentage do you have? Ah, they, they go from there. Okay. You can speak well. So now your competency comes in. Good speaker, good delivery. And if you're really that good, you're a teacher of many. Our world, very different. Their world, the teacher commands a very high standing. Okay? And respected by many top people in society. This is a conventional one. See? Money comes in. No different from us. Money still comes in. Okay? I don't want to go into this. This is not the important part. But I want you to know that all these fascinating suitors give a glimpse, give you a glimpse of the Buddha's work, and I love it. Okay, Chanki. Chanki is very special in the Brahmin society. And I'll talk a little bit more about him. He was an exalted esteemed leader. He had all of the above. So in their Brahmin world, they consider him claim, claim, top notch. And he said he's going to visit the Buddha and they all flipped. Because like, yo, you, so big. It's, it's like, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew said, I'm going to visit so and so. And then the, everyone, why? Right. You're such a big time thing, right? And he said, because the Buddha was like that. And so he also came up with one, two, three, four. 
birth, physical. Uh, he, uh, he had all these. So dot, dot, dot means it's already there before. But he introduced new ones. Chunky was impressed that the Buddha went from home to homeless, renounced at the prime of his life, abandoning the gold and the bullion. He went into homelessness while still young. A black-haired young man, though his parents wept with tearful faces. So everybody knew at that time that the Buddha left when he was young and the parents were not agreeable. Everybody knew that it was his reputation. So he said, now I am impressed with that. This is an important point. You may not appreciate how critical this point is. You see, for the Brahmin, they have certain seasons of life. We like to call that also. But they do have seasons of life. In the youth, you do your best for society. You run your household to the best that you can. Store the gold and bullion for your descendants. When you are much older, you have done your duty, then you go into spiritual pursuit. This is their, their seasons of life. Chunky is saying, this guy left when he was a young man. Many of his peers would be disapproving. They would look at it and go, Salah. But he's saying, oh, no, no. That makes him special. So actually, this makes Chunky special. Makes him unique. Makes him a wise man. So he's a wise man. Not done, huh? A lot more. He said the Buddha was free from sensual lust and no personal vanity. So lovely the words. Free from so no one talks about this, but Chanki says that he has no craving, there's no lust, there's no vanity. And okay. You will look at this and you go, there's one of those words that you will just skip the line. But this is important. This is about karma. Holds the doctrine of the moral efficacy of action, of deeds. It means karma. He believes, the Buddha believes in karma. But he does not seek any harm for Brahmin. So he doesn't, he does, he, even though his doctrine and the Brahmana doctrine were very different. Brahmanas didn't believe in Kama the way the Buddha did. For the Brahmana, Kama is about sacrifices, making sacrifices, pleasing the gods, having that sort of transactional relationship with the gods. You understand, huh? No, you don't. I tell you how. Why is it different? If you believe that I go and pray, pray, pray. I ask for help. Help will come. I'll be fine. You actually belong to the Brahmana gang. Okay? Because you're saying, I can whitewash my, my problems with a transactional relationship with gods. That's what you're saying. I go pray, pray, pray. I do pray, pray, pray for what? I go pray, pray, pray. Ask for help. Ask for help. Then I get my blessing. I'm done. I'm good. If you do it like this, actually, the underlying instinct, instinct is not karma. You may say you believe in karma, but the underlying instincts, the, the, the one deep inside, your deeper driver, believes you can buy your way out of problems or you can negotiate your way out of problems. If you believe in karma, you just focus on keeping the mind pure, keeping your words and action free from harming others and yourself. That would be your focus, not Jiwi Jabgo must go temple and then be vegetarian for half a day because they only expect half a day. And even better, do 8% that store up merits. Okay, that was also a bit off. So we all chapalang la. 
right? We are a bit here and there. Okay, anyhow, back to this. Chunky is basically saying that even though our doctrines are very different, he never make things difficult for us. He didn't cause us trouble. By the ha means causing us trouble, creating problems. He, he never did that. So Chunky respects. Here it tells you, actually the Buddha didn't pick a fight with the Brahmins. It wasn't his style. In fact, that, that was for something he had said before. I don't pick a fight with the world. Who picks a fight with me? So this one is Chunky affirming that. Okay, so we all know this. You see, if you know someone who had someone who had uh, who have uh who who is well born, come from very rich family. The who take what family? You know, so rich, like as they walk, they drop coins type. Gold coin, eh? very rich. And then he left them all behind, be a monk. Go into the forest somewhere and eat one, one meal a day. All of you, I mean, not all of you, but all of society, the modern world go, why? Even we cannot understand, right? Like, why? Uh, like that, like that. The Buddha, what we do know, I, I've always said Buddha's not from the royal, from royalty. He's not, Prince, but yes, the Sakyans were rich. The Sakyans were very rich. They were famous for their resources and wealth, for sure. If you look at the kind of resources they talk about, right? They about cloth, the clothes, cloth from Kasi, you mean? Then you go, uh huh. Think of it like Prada. Use only Prada. Hermes, uh, Hermes, carry Hermes back type, okay? Big time. So they are, they are that kind of wealthy. And comes his reputation. People come from far away to play Q&A with him. And then you say, not a big deal. What, what you think? Uh, online, just type the question and shoom at you. No, they have to travel the distance. You will only travel the distance. Two things, two conditions must be present. One, you have heard of him. You go and look for who, right? You have heard of him. And if you live in remote land and have heard of him, you know Buddha was very famous. Two, you believe he will have something to say that can help you. Otherwise, why would you go? So his reputation must have been really phenomenal. What must it be like to live in his world? To be able to pose a question and have your name captured for 2,500 years. History. Beautiful, isn't it? So these guys all went to him. And there is this reputation that even the deities, deities go for him. We know, uh, if you look at Mahaparinibbana Sutta, you know there are Arya Devas. Devas who have who are enlightened in different stages. You know, it's in, it's in Mahaparinibbana. You can read between the lines and find it. And so deities going to him for refuge, gaining and being enlightened by him, not rare. Must be. Okay. And this. Your iti piso bagawa arahan is what is his reputation card. It is his calling card. Accomplished, fully enlightened, perfect in true knowledge and conduct, sublime, know the words, etc., etc. Okay. Okay, this one is a Brahmin thing. The Brahmin believe that if you are indeed once a lifetime great man, your physiognomy will tell. So the Brahmins have been known to like check out his footprint, check out things about him. But this one I considered, I, I as a scholar say that this is possibly, possibly a later edition because all the two months don't make sense. I believe it's a possibly a later edition. It's exaggerated. 
basically it's just an exaggeration. Buddha the hand cannot be that long, the feet cannot be like this, the teeth. If he if if he if this were true, he would not look human. It cannot be. So I believe this is a later day, but they might have been their own marks that they were looking for. Okay. And all this famous, also back to this famous people have gone to him for refuge, for life. Okay? Very good, huh? So what does all this tell us about the Buddha? He's famous for very good reasons. And, and his reputation really precedes him. A lot of all kinds of people will come to him. So Chanki is basically saying, the king went, the Dewas went, all these great people went, people from far, far away. Uh, America came and go to him. Why can't I go? Doesn't make sense. Uh, so basically, he's saying like that, lah. Okay. Okay. That that is the that's the beginning of the sutta. Okay. I cut short some of parts of the sutta because I want to race to the end. So, um, while except when Chunky visit and it's very fascinating when he visited, you you they were captured, no? They have an exchange of pleasantries. Ni hao ma, wo hao. Ni tsu ba ba, wo tsu la. That's kind, that kind of uh, very pleasant uh, pleasantries. Okay? Much about nothing kind of pleasantries. Then, one of Chunky's... So this is called Chunky Sutta. But the conversation is not between Chunky and the Buddha. It's between this guy called Kapatika. Kapatika, who is a student. Chunky student. Who people thought he thought. People thought he thought. The Buddha said, Yo, sit. <laughs> okay, he did say it like that. The Buddha says, Behave yourself. Actually, if you read between the lines, that's what he said. Behave yourself. Because, so you understand that in their time, not our time. You see, if you use our time to measure, you will say, Oh, why? Particular. But in their time, it's considered ultimate root if adult talk and young people inter inter interrupt it's considered ultimate root so the Buddha having a conversation with Chunky the boss and this young fellow piping up piping up then he like that okay Chunky came to the defense of this young man and went oh don't don't say he's actually very smart really very smart. Chunky, uh, uh, this guy, uh, Kapatika, was actually very excited. You read it, you know. He is actually because he's very excited. So because he's so excited, it's like a two-year-old, cannot keep his mouth shut, right? Cannot wait for your turn. No, 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 he must intervene. That's the reason why he was interrupting. And Chunky defended him to say, the guy, the boy, very smart. He, he will talk sensibly. You give him a chance, he'll talk sensibly. Then the Buddha went, hmm, old teacher defending young boy. This boy must be quite special. So pay attention. The young boy went, yes, he's looking at me. Now I can ask my question. You read the sutta. This is actually what happened. The, 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 he said, if the Buddha look at me, I will ask him the question. What does that mean? Right? So okay, then the Buddha said, his question was, the Brahmana said their teaching, only their teaching is true. Everyone else is wrong. What do you say? What do you say, Pate? That's a tough question. Think about it. Your kid, just your kid, you're not in an audience. It's just your kid come up to you and say, you say you are right. Other people also say they are right and yours is wrong. What do you say? There you are. <laughs> yeah, I want you to put yourself in the Buddha's shoes. Okay? Someone say everybody also say they right what? Why is yours right and others wrong? There you go. Hmm. You wait, I check Chunky Sutta. <laughs> Let me read to you what the Buddha said. Okay. The Buddha said. There are five things. Bardiatwatja. Bardiatwatja, I'm not sure if that's his name. I really am not sure. I don't know whether that's a title or something. Because I've seen this word, Bradwadja, associated with Brahmins. So next time it comes, I will ask him. There are five things, Bradwadja, that may turn out in two different 
ways here and now. Don't read. <laughs> Look at it. You can read, but you must pay attention to these words. What five? Faith, approval, tradition, risen cognition, reflective acceptance. Now we pause here. You ask yourself, why would you accept something to be true or not? You ask yourself. This is a shortened version of the epistemological arguments in Kalama Sutta. Okay, it's a shortened one. This is only five. But these are the five most common ones. Kalamas, they are thinkers, a lot of philosophers. So he went deeper into the details. But this one, he has only five ways in which people believe something to be true or not. Basically, that's what it means. There are five ways that the person perceives something to be true or not. One. Faith, I believe you. I trust you. Then, because I trust you, whatever you say, I say, mm, deal. correct, correct. You tell me, dangerous. Huh? Really, right? Blind, absolutely blind. The problem for our society uh, today is our blind faith even goes onto YouTube and social media. TikTok say so must be true. I know because I'm, I'm living with someone who tells me, oh, you cannot eat too much of this. Why? Because in YouTube, I watch. Mom, nah, I'm serious. <laughs> <laughs> but it means I believe you, I trust you. And typically, it's based on some kind of dubious authority. If it appears, you see, the older ones amongst us, we live through an age where information is filtered before it's presented on national TV. Yes, that's our time. Today, information is no longer filtered by anyone and happily flung on the YouTube or Facebook or wherever. There is no filtering. But we carry a certain assumption over. It's presented in the big white world must be correct. That's our assumption. Okay? Salah. The Buddha said, based on faith, people believe. Number two, based on approval. I like what you say. I agree. Must be true. Which means sitting on feelings. Huh? Approval means sitting on a good feeling you are basically just agreeing to something because you feel good. So easy to manipulate, you know, feelings. So easy. Three, sorry, personal inclination. Exactly. Three, oral tradition. Oral tradition is my mother's favorite word. Nao nang ta. Oh, People say. Now, this also comes from a different time when you must understand in a much different world where you have no education, then the person who is the oldest would have the most experience of life. Because they have the most experience of life, they surely know more than you. So old people say you must listen. But in this world, there's equalization of education, right? Everybody has access to all kinds of material. As long as you don't waste your time playing computer game, watching Korean drama, mindlessly gorging yourself silly somewhere, and you spend time reading, reflecting, examining books, or ebook also can, but not TikTok, TikTok needs a lot of filtering. I'm not having a personal agenda, okay? <laughs> I'm not picking a fight, but I'm just saying I cannot believe the dog run and run and run that well, time is up. Never mind. No, it's okay if you do it once in a while, but if you do it the whole day, you have a problem. There's a generation of people looking attention fan five seconds. How, how long is TikTok? 
Is anybody in? Oh, you're all wrong age group. <laughs> wrong age profile. 15 seconds? Some seconds, like one minute, two minutes. Okay. It's one of those things. Okay. So, oral tradition essentially means what the world has believed. Okay. And you know, for the longest and biggest, cutest thing is the world is flat. I know some people still believe that, but the world is flat. And today we know it's not. But for the longest time, a lot of people believe that. And the Buddha was not wrong when he said, based on these, cannot say it's true. Okay? Reason cognitation, ah, this is the problematic one. It means you thought through, reason it out, conclude, you say must be right. So what are you trusting? Your own judgment, your own reasoning skill. Your own reasoning skill. This one, reason connotation is your own logic. Now we know all kinds of logic. Some of which not very well logic. But because they believe that they are right. Okay, And finally, reflective acceptance of a view. Reflective acceptance of view means, yeah, you thought about something, you thought really hard, and then you think to yourself and say, makes sense. Huh? Not logically, not reason out, not, not based on deduction or analysis. It's just, mm, I think so. Leh. All right. Eh? Makes sense. Huh? Then, like that. Loh. A view. These five things, so these five ways of conclusion may turn out in two different ways. Here now means, right now you know, can turn out two ways. It may be empty. See the word? It, can you see the word? It may be empty here. It may be empty, hollow, and false. So based on, I can agree with it. I like what I think about it. I know the feeling. I approve, approve. I believe in you. All these, huh? I believe in you. I approve, I approve. Uh, I thought through, logically, everybody say so. Then I thought about it. It makes sense. Okay. It may be hollow. It may be false, hollow, and empty. Something that you don't agree with. Something you don't accept. You don't approve. It doesn't feel good about it. You thought about it. It doesn't make sense, etc., etc. All five of them. But yet, they may be factual, true, and unmistaken. So basically, the Buddha is saying that the world, in the way that the world thinks, or feel is true, that in itself doesn't make it true. You may not agree with it. You may not feel good about it. You may not think it makes sense. No one talks about it because it's not in anybody's popular consciousness. And you didn't spend time thinking about it anyway. But yet, that's true. That's correct. So, this... Part one. This is only part one. Factually, Usala, right? Correct. It's the part two. Under this condition, it is not proper, it's not correct for a wise person who seeks to preserve truth. If you really honor the truth, if you really want to know the truth, he said, you cannot come to the conclusion what I hold is true and everything else is false. That's basically what he's saying. Based on how you conclude about things, don't know what's your preference. You can tell me. How do you usually arrive at the truth? Okay, You know. If this were a workshop, I will stop here and maybe have discussion. Everybody, blah, 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 blah. But it's not a workshop, it's a talk. So we have to keep going. Okay? Only you know what how you tend to jump to conclusion. It's like jumping to conclusion. But when you jump to conclusion, the Buddha is saying, you cannot say, only what I have concluded is true and everything else is false. Understand? Okay, yeah? moving on. So this young man, Bradwajar, said, then in what way 
is there the preservation of truth? In what way, therefore, it is correct to conclude this is true? How do you do that? The Buddha said, here, if he, so you must remember the five. We'll call it the five. Okay? I think I don't have to repeat everything. The five. Faith, approval, oral tradition, reason, cognition, acceptance with a view. Okay, that five. He preserves truth when he say, this is how I concluded. My faith is thus. Okay? That means I said, I accept this, but this is how I accepted it. My faith, I thought about it, I like it. So you must acknowledge how you arrive at it. Okay? My faith is thus. But he doesn't get to the point to say, only this is correct, others are wrong. In other words, he said, I believe like that, but I'm open. That's basically what it is in our language. I say, I believe in this, but I am mindful it may or may not turn out to be correct. I am still open to other views. That's what it means. This is what the Buddha is saying. This is how you learn to keep your mind focused on going for the truth. Think of it like this. Oh, okay, everybody, oh, I'll try very hard to remember. Oh my gosh, so many words. Okay, come down, come down. Okay. You are all investigators. Yeah, scenario, scenario. You're all investigators, okay? All the, I don't know how many of you. 50? Okay, 50 of you. We're now going to a crime scene. It's a murder scene. Okay? Then you all flood in. Go, go, go. And then you all must tiptoe around so you don't, to, don't mess up all the clues. Huh? All the, what do you call? Uh, evidence. Yes, don't go and mess up people's evidence. Huh? So all of you tiptoeing in. Okay? And then as you're looking around, some of you starting to form your opinion. Okay? Reason connectation is beginning to form. Then some of you look at the possible suspect. I don't like that guy. I don't like that guy. I, like that guy. Okay? I believe, uh, I believe he's responsible. Okay? So you're, all your feelings are coming up. So your reasoning, your feeling. And then some of you are saying, I'm going to study the evidence. Okay? I'm going to reason it out. La, 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 la. Then looks like it could be that guy. Okay? You're saying like that. La. Now, at that point, if you say, I'm beginning to form an idea, but I'm not sure. I'm open. It means you are respectful. You are preserving the truth. Because you haven't, you haven't said, Tio Leo, must be him, you, must be you, must be. Why? He too tall. You understand? This is actually what the Buddha was saying. You keep an open mind. You are mindful of how your mind arrives at a conclusion, but you say, I keep an open mind because I am aware this may not be it. That's what it means. So what does that mean for us as practitioner, as seeker of the Buddha's Dhamma? What does it mean? We will have experiences. We will have some degree of insights here and there. But we must always be mindful that is a preliminary conclusion. A preliminary one. And we want to keep an open mind until the next lot comes along. There's something else after this. This is not the end of the sutta. If the end of the sutta, we'll go, Chee, I like that was so cat oh. No, 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 no. The Buddha has a lot more. Okay, everyone is good here. So now this young man wants to know then how do you arrive? How do you get there? How do you discover? Can it be done? Can it is it possible? Because you're telling me 
that in all these ways I think about things, I cannot conclude this is it. Then how, in what way can I then conclude, he said. Basically, that's his question. Listen carefully to the Buddha's guidance and you ask yourself if that was how you have arrived at wherever you are. A bhikkhu may be living in dependence on some village or town. Then a householder goes and investigates him in regard to three states, greed, hatred, and delusion. I stop here first. So essentially, you have a teacher, a bhikkhu, you have a teacher. And this teacher is there in your midst. How do you decide if you want to listen to this teacher? So the Buddha is saying, okay, here you are, you go and observe him, investigate. It's just a tougher word. But the idea here is you observe whether or not he demonstrates behavior telling you he has greed, hatred, and delusion. Are there in this venerable any states based on greed such that his mind is obsessed by those states? Point one. Can you see whether he is driven, obsessed? He's driven. He's preoccupied. Every day he sees you, he asks for more. He wants something. Or you go and engage with him and you notice that there is this fire. Not burning his thing, but burning out. Anger, easily triggered. Okay, so that's the idea here. Obsess. And while, so that's point one. Huh? You can see that that's happening. And point two, while not knowing, he say, I know. While not seeing, he say, I see. That's the second part. So part one, by his behavior, you can observe that he has loba, greed, dosa, anger, delusion. Okay, that one needs judgment, but it's okay. Just put at these two. Defilements. You see defilements, the fellow has delusion. So that's point one. Point two. There is false claim. There are false claims. Not seeing, he said, I see. See that? Not knowing, he said, I know. False claims. But it means falsehood. The person is capable of lying. So the Buddha is saying, someone who is practicing well, practicing in accordance with the path. This is what is implied here. Someone who is practicing in accordance with the path, this person is honest. That's what he's saying. Okay? And the third one is he urged others to act in a way that would lead to their harm and suffering for a long time. So if someone encourages you to pick a fight, to let it out, not let it go, okay? <laughs> let it out. To encouraging you to do things that actually will cause you more greed, more anger, all permutations of greed and anger urge you to do it. His advice is counterproductive. His advice causes you more harm than good, more pain than worth your while. That's the three parts. Do you remember? One, you can see for yourself all kinds of funny behavior that you will not associate with one who is on the path. Two, this person, the words are not totally accurate, honest. So there's some degree of dishonesty going on. And three, the advice that he gives you is going to give you more trouble, give you more, more pain, more suffering. Okay? If you observe and you notice, no have, no have. Good tick, good tick, good tick. It's a tick, not a cross. Okay, tick, tick, tick. Three tick. You're in. Okay. Uh, what's that? 
uh, talent, talent, uh, Britain got talent, uh, three tick, go, you're in. Eh, no more, okay? There are no such dates in this person. Listen, uh, there are no such dates. The bodily, verbal action, 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 are not those of one affected by greed, hatred, delusion. You will first gauge. So the Buddha's advice in his days to various people has always been see for yourself. Before you dumb a million, observe the behavior, see whether there are all these. And, and he even told some, take time to observe. Don't jump like, oh, I don't see, I don't see, then, yeah. He actually told them, take time to observe. Associate more with this person, more. Okay. Only when someone in your mind, in your observation, don't have all these negative habits, the way he talks, the way he behaves, because you can't see his mind. Right, right. We all cannot see his mind, right? Yeah. So observe the way he talks, observe the way he behaves. And if you are confident he doesn't have those, comes the next part. Then the Dhamma that he teaches is profound, hard to see, hard to understand, peaceful, sublime, unattainable by mere reasoning, subtle to be experienced by the wise. Dhamma cannot be taught by one affected by greed, anger, and delusion. That is step one. That is only step one for the discovery of truth. So here it is implied, you don't know, right? You got to find someone who can help. Implied here, under discovery of truth, implied here is you on your own can't do it, right? So you've got to find someone, right? But before you settle on that someone, can you pay attention to how he speaks, how he acts? You must be convinced and confident this person doesn't have very strong, he's not average person. He is not obsessed and motivated by greed, anger, delusion. It's not obvious at all. Not obvious at all. Because you believe that the Dhamma can be taught only by someone whose mind is soft, does not have all these unwholesome mental states. Look, if the person is like you and me, then what are we learning from him? You see what I'm saying? That's, that's basically the point. Okay. Up until this point, everyone is good. Ah, now you have this Sikki Atas one, huh? Right? Hey, hey, hey. Hey, Sikki Atas, right? He's very Sikki Atas. Very good. So nice. So soft-spoken. Very gentle. Totally cannot see. Not even spark, spark. Don't have. Very, very calm. Ah, okay. Now we're going to learn from him. When you have investigated, then you place faith. The faith must sit on action, behavior, conduct. Because, so I judge entirely by character, in other words. Based on character, so you want to find somebody to help. Based entirely, almost entirely on character, we start first. Then they say, okay, you must have confidence. The word that was chosen in the translation was faith. But I will put it slightly differently. Confidence. Trust. Okay? You don't like the word faith? We take it out of the equation. We call it trust and confidence. So with confidence and trust, then you must visit and pay respect. Because if you don't bow, your mind is still arrogant. So you must visit. Okay, then you say, I visit on website, can I? Uh, can I, can I? I know you, but in the time of the Buddha, cannot. Okay? 
in the time of the Buddha, there was no choice other than a physical attendance. But today, minimally, I have faith. I trust that you know the Dhamma. I know your behavior is like this. Yeah, of course, if it's on YouTube, you can't tell. So you do have to go and like, interact a bit. Then I, and here say not enough. Uh, yeah, everybody say you're very good, you're very good. No, Buddha say you must see for yourself. Okay? Once you pay respect, and this is where it starts, give ear and hear. I always say, give ear and hear. That I give, so what it means is, I listen and I pay attention. Because only when you're paying attention can you remember. This up to this point is a critical early steps. If you don't remember, how do you apply? Because the practice is not about pure work, pure reason cognition. You have to apply. Now, you remember, after you recall, it memorizes. He used the word memorize. But what I, I'm, I'm, I'm not Buddha, so I gentler. You remember. Remember well. You remember well, and then you can examine the meaning of the teaching. You don't remember. He says, all phenomenal, all conditioned phenomenal is impermanent. The Buddha said that. Then when you are on your own and you're seated back, did he say all or some? Huh? And then you forgot condition. So all phenomena impermanent. Mm -hmm. Condition, condition. So the words that he said, the way he said it, your form is impermanent. Your feelings are impermanent. Your, then you say, I know already. There is that. Exception, done. Yes, but what does that mean? What does it mean by the form being impermanent? Why does he insist you must reflect on it? Reflect, examine the meaning. Why must you examine the meaning? Form is impermanent, ma. you say. What is there to examine? It's impermanent. You don't examine it doesn't sink. It doesn't sink. It doesn't touch your subconscious. It doesn't sink into the subconscious. If it doesn't go into the subconscious in your daily life, you will not be using it. It has to sink in until it hits you at a very deep level. So that would happen only when you keep reflecting. So he says, examine the meaning, gain, examine it, then you kind of gain a reflective acceptance, then the zeal springs up. So, what basically he's saying is, if you look at the teaching for noble troops, maybe just deal with that. Let's just deal with one. Number one. The number one is the easiest. Now, you tell me, what did the Buddha say about the four noble truths? The first one. The noble truth of Dukkha. And it starts with birth is suffering, aging is suffering, sick is suffering, death is suffering. Let me just put a full stop there. When was the last time you thought about this? Last retreat. When was that? <laughs> which means we don't do a reflective thing. You see? So let's say, let's see if you require, let's say, birth is suffering. And then you said, birth is suffering. How is birth suffering? Birth is suffering. Hello, birth really must grow up, go to school. Yeah, suffering, suffering. Ayo, it's true, it's true, especially in Singapore. Ayo, must go to four-year-old go play school. Eaten, eaten. Five-year-old eaten, not good enough. Go give the program, don't know where, don't know what. Because your family rich, ma, you, know, you practice in the past, always giving dana everywhere. So in this life, born into some 
super lamok family, right? This really the uh, you know the sort uh, that they walk, they walk on carpet this thick, this thick. You sink your feet in, then you got to yank your feet out and you stomp, okay? That kind, huh? And then you reflect and you crack that it's true. Because once you're born, you have a body. As a human, you have a body. Immediately it starts. Sprain your leg, huh? Because you big time, right? Play golf to the head on the head with the golf ball, right? All kinds of funny things happens. I mean, I'm making a joke out of this, but you know what I mean. And that only comes after you have reflected a little bit other than from this suffering, aging suffering, blah, 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 done. I've done my daily reflection. But when you think a bit deeper, and then it starts to make you feel, it has to touch your sensation, huh? it touch your way, the now feeling. It makes you feel, they go, yeah, it's true, it's true. But if you end there, then dukkha lah. Because if four of them, you must have sensation of dukkha, let's just go all the way, right? And then it gets to the point where you go, actually, it's so beautiful, this Dhamma. So beautiful. That's why your zeal will come out. When you reflect a bit deeper, and then you go, this is exactly how I experience life. I totally agree. Wow. Brilliant, you said. And then, the zeal means your energy search. The zeal springs up. When it has sprung up, then you apply your will. You then have intention to practice. Okay? Intention. Once the intention arises, you are going to be even more meticulous, more careful in how you examine the body. You look at how he said, I'm going to read fast. Huh? Scrutinize, strive, realizes with the body the supreme truth and see it by penetrating it with wisdom. In other words, in this practice, you cannot get away from spending time observing your body and everything associated with body and mind. How the brain, how the mind works, how it talks, how it gets gripped by desires. And by looking at the body, just by examining the body, you can. Why? I ask all of you, stop breathing. Don't breathe. Can or not? Cannot. No need to die. Just suffer terribly. You're just holding your breath for a while. Cannot. What does that tell you? You cannot stop breathing. The body breathes on its own. What does that tell you? Noble truth, yes. But which one of the characteristics? Clearly anatta. Actually, all three. Anicca, dukkha, anatta. Just by watching the breathing. Just by watching the breathing, you will see impermanence. You try and control it, you really suffer. Tukka. And, and, and you, you see in this impermanence, why is there the dukkha in the impermanence? You've got to keep pulling and you have to keep doing that. Okay? Your body has done such a marvelous job, you're not aware. But when you are sick with a lung condition, you're very aware of how laborious breathing is. And you have zilch control over the whole process, which is so obvious. It's anatta. You sit down there and you just watch this guy pulsate on his own. By just looking at it, it's anatta. What does anatta mean? What does self selflessness? You, you got self there, man? Why are yourself so hopeless? One cannot stop the breathing. There is no control. The notion, the idea of a self is control and will. You tell me what is self. The critical component of self is will. I will, therefore I am. Actually, it's, uh, you know, right? Descartes, Descartes. Descartes is different, but 
Yeah. You have will. Willing means I have preferences. Will means I have preferences. I have desires. Willing means I have preferences of desire. But you know your preferences and desire is all in your mind. You have no control over outcome. Okay? So that's another. That's why he said, when you pay attention to this body and you spend time examining it in accordance with the framework he gave you, what is the Buddha's framework? Four Noble Truth, Tilakana, three characteristics. Uh, aggregates, six sense bases. Actually, there are a few more other things, but with this, it's good to go. You're good to go. And you keep looking at the body and the aggregates along that framework. Anicca, dukkha, anatta, impermanence, suffering, anatta. I don't want to translate anatta. I just don't like any of the translations. I like anatta. Okay. And the day that the body becomes obvious to you, you see in your body the truths, the truths, four noble truths, characteristic, three characteristics. This is how you discover truth. This is the process. Find someone you trust because you have observed in this person purity of conduct behavior. That purity of conduct and behavior, or words, reflects a pure mind. I want to learn from someone with purity, a good man, a true, a subpurisa, a good man. Going to him, paying my respect, paying attention to his guidance, I apply. I must pay attention, I must remember, then I can apply. I will first look at the body, observe how it, how the, the characteristics are, observe the bodily characteristics, look at it and say, actually, everything that the teacher said makes sense, eh? makes sense. Okay, now I'm going to really examine this body properly. I'm going to listen to sound, I'm going to, have to observe form, I'm going to observe all these conditional things, I'm going to pay close attention, and as I observe, I feel more and more confidence. I say, wow, my mind is settling. It's becoming calmer. I'm feeling so much better. I like this. I continue. I push on. Stare hard at the body. Look at how the Dhamma arises in the body. The body is your teacher. That's basically what it means. And you will only realize it when the wisdom faculty ripens. You will realize it. Up until the point you realize it, you're not called the wise. You are a bit wise, wiser than national average because you have chosen to come and study the body. Look at how it works because you believe that my joy, my joy, my sense of end of suffering comes from learning to live with this one wisely. You, you will have it along that line. And then, oh, start to pay attention and lo and behold, the Dhamma correlates, his teaching correlates with your observation. You say, Dio, this is really good. And you continue. Then at some point, say, yeah, in this way, there is the discovery of truth. In this way, one discovers truth. In this way, we describe the discovery. There's a process. The way, the word here, the focus here is the way, in this way. Okay? But as yet, no final arrival at truth. This is how you discover. So by this statement, what does it tell you? By this statement. Job not done yet, well done. Yeah? But you have seen. This is how you discover truth. This is the way to discover truth. But it's not that's what it means. Which then tells you, in the process, the enlightenment process, is a process. This is, this is basically the enlightenment, the awakening. 
experience. It's a process. It's in stages. You catch a glimpse. You have a dot connection. You connected the dot. He said, noble truth. This is the noble truth. In the breathing is the noble truth. In the breathing is the noble truth. A human, you have breathing. If you day one got no breathing, I think, I believe, I don't think they have lungs. But in it, for the human, you have lungs, you're, you're breathing. In the breathing is the noble truth. Every in is a birth. Every out is a death. It goes in and it flows. Life and death. You, the breathing is comfortable, you like. A bit of discomfort, you don't like. But you cannot control it. This is conditional arising. You see know what I'm saying? Your lungs are conditioned. I mean, the entire process of breathing is conditional arising. Working lungs, oxygen, osmosis done properly, exchange all within a process that you don't control. You are the beneficiary. So by looking at this breathing, you are experiencing the Dhamma. That's why the Buddha used Anapanasati for training. Okay? And if you understand that, in that moment, you have experienced one, one, one glimpse of the truth. One glimpse of it. But is it final? No. So that's why we know there is no final arrival yet. 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 But the great news is, ah, it can be done. So, so this boy, very smart. Lucky we got a very smart boy there. Because if he's not very smart, and he's not very brave, he's not the, like, I want the Buddha to answer me, type, then we would have ended a page earlier. But because he's very smart, and he wants to know, and he's earnest, so he says, there is a discovery, okay, we hear that, we recognize that. Then is there a final arrival at truth? In what way does one finally arrive at truth? The final arrival at truth, Biodwatja, lies in the repetition, development, and cultivation of the same things. In other words, all that you have done earlier, observe the body, look in the body, examine the body, la 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 la, everything. Continue. Repetition, development, cultivation. You cannot you know, it doesn't work like that. We spend this life practicing and observing. After all, you eat every day, right? I assume. A preset also got eat one meal, right? We eat every day. We feed this body well. Do we feed the mind as well? So my question to you is this. You feed your body so well. You three times a day, you will be planning your food. Do we feed this mind as well? Do we spend three times a day to feed it with wholesome thoughts, wholesome mental states, or we let it do whatever we want, about whatever it wants? We don't, right? We don't let the mind run riot. Sorry, we don't let our body run riot, right? We are very careful what we put in. We put in what we like, what we enjoy. Yes, yes, some people are like that. I'm one of those. And there are the ones who are very careful and very disciplined and they put in only the things they understand. Not true, but not true. They understand. They believe. They have reason, cognition that it is good for the body. They do that, lah, right? And we do that. Some of us do that. But do we do that with the mind? If your answer is... A resounding yes. Sweet out. Body, mind, you feed well. If your answer is the embarrassed silence, 
uh, then do something about it lah. Okay? Do something about it, okay? And I will give you some ideas how to do it properly. Repetition. So repetition means you need to go back again and again to the body. Not one time done. Nah. Somebody done. Who does that? You, know, you have to do more. Huh? You do it in the sense that every look, I ask you, huh? I ask you this. Back to my old question. You all eat every day, right? You eat the same food every day? Most of you don't. Nah. Okay, when you eat the same food every day, do you have the same experience? Even if you eat the same food. I eat only carrot. Every day I chew on this carrot. Do you chew the same? Does it taste the same? Is your experience identical? Then why you expect the jhana to be the same? Eh? Why do you expect your meditation to be the same? Eh? You think about it. If you're eating, an experience is different. If you watch a movie, an experience is different. Every time you watch it, you repeat it 10 times. It's just still... A bit different, a bit different. You find something new. Why is it when you sit and you meditate, you want to go back to that one? I want that version. Only that version. Other version, I don't want. I just the one that I had in that retreat ten years ago. That one I want. So just understand body and mind. Same, same one. Conditioning your reason. All same, 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 same. Okay. So repetition, development, and cultivation. If I want to push it a bit further. It's about the Buddha didn't explain why didn't the Buddha go into go into a lot more detailed explanation. He just talk about the eightfold path here. You notice that he didn't talk about cultivation of mental states. He even talk about the process by which one arrives at truth. He was trying to guide this boy to go and stare at his body, look at the form, look at it well, but he didn't talk, he didn't say anything about the noble truths. Because he's a Brahmana. This is not a Buddhist. This is someone whose question started with, how do we tell? How, how can we be sure that's truth? So he's not teaching a student here. He's teaching someone who's new, who doesn't understand. And he's explaining to this guy, actually, in order to finally arrive at the truth, if you were to take one step back and you look at it, what did he mean by the process of it? He's saying, there has to be a mixture of steps. A mixture of things, and these are the key components. One, you've got to learn from someone. You've got to have trust in someone. Learn from outside. So all his teachings, by the way, uh, how do you build wisdom? Four parts, two of which is external. Associating with a sub researcher Associating with someone who is wise and good and kind and has understanding, la la, la la, la la, criteria are very long. Okay? Associating with that and hearing the true Dhamma. So the assumption the Buddha had of everyone in his time and probably in his sasana is that we all have to learn somewhere. We have to start somewhere. We have to learn from someone. Then how do you tell if you can learn from that person minimally You've got one standard. Minimally, look at the behavior, the character. If you can see in the behavior, this person's obsessions and motivations are unwholesome. Be careful. If you can see, and you can tell, wholesome, unwholesome. You are so good at judging, right? Why you know judge le? This one is the person you're going to learn from, you know. You must be as critical as you can be. But you cannot be critical for your own, I mean, just for the sake of it. Like, oh, she gave me the permission to be critical. Hey, why dress like that? Hey, why walk like that? Greed, anger, delusion. Okay? Greed, anger, delusion. Then, so assumption one, you will learn from someone. Look at person's character, behavior, the way he talks, if you're very confident this person sits on purity, good mind, wholesome mind, gentle manners, oh, I got to learn from this guy. Then teacher, can you help me? I need to understand more. Teacher, explain. Teacher will explain to you the steps. Then you must remember and apply. 
then you see for yourself. So the second part is, so you make a judgment about someone, you learn from someone out there. After that, you must apply. You must understand correctly, know exactly what's teach, apply accordingly. Apply and observe. So there is a requirement for you to pay attention. Pay attention, be mindful, be objective, have some clarity. So there is a bit of a juggling going on. There's a juggling, right? Can you see that juggling? I must remember what you say. Then I must see in me. Then I must know how to oh, cultivate this and do that and tweak it like this and look at this. Oh, yeah, so many things. Yeah, character reformation, see like that one. Yeah. You just have to do these things. Okay. Now, if you are his student and you are learning at his feet, this thing about repetition, develop, that's why he didn't explain it's the same thing. So it's back to the steps. But he didn't say more here. Actually, there are more here. Repetition, develop, cultivation of what? Mental states. The correct mental states, wisdom, morality, and samadhi. Those are the minimum. Sister, is there a shortcut? This is the shortest cut. Because you want the long cut, you got 37 of them. It's called the 37 factors of enlightenment. Minimally, or for the 37 factors of enlightenment, you look at the seven set, minimally four. So three is still shorter. Okay, he said, enough or not? If you know what you're doing, enough. If you don't know what you're doing, 37 also not enough. If you know what you're doing, enough. If you don't know what you're doing, 37 also not enough. And how do I know what I'm doing? First, find a teacher that you trust, has what it takes to guide you, and you go. Listen, quick, quiet, here, follow. And then, even better, you got the Buddha's guidance now. For you, you got the Nikayas. Yeah. You got the Nikayas can be done. Okay? In this way, Bhadwaja, there is a final arrival at truth. In this way, one finally arrives at truth. In this way, we describe the final arrival of truth. So you will say, talk over, how much time do I have? I still got a bit, right? Talk over. Ah, Buddha style repetition. Okay. So now it goes backward. Backward. Starts with, what is the most helpful for the final arrival at truth? Striving. You have to keep going at it. Oh. Striving. You have to keep going at it. Once you understand, because look, what are we doing? We are rewiring the mind. And you are rewiring for this and future lives. You are rewiring your mind for this life and the future lives. Because if you rewire wisely and correctly, it sets a very good foundation for the next you, the next one, your successor, to pick up from where you left. If you do such a bad job in the rewiring process, you did such a bad job and you are confused, you're all over the place, then you 60% play, 30% rest, 10% because my friend says so, I follow, go for retreat type. Okay? Your rewiring effort is just so bad. The poor fellow who comes up next will come up and go, what do I have? Yeah, my predecessor did such a bad job. <laughs> what do I have? I've got nothing. I got a nice family. It's a very good family. I got air conditioning in the room. And a car that drives me to school every day. I, like, remind me to tell you a cute story, but that's after this. Okay, striving. Okay, get it right. What is most helpful for striving? Scrutiny. So the more you see. The more you examine, the more you understand, the more it will inspire you to practice. Okay? 
Then what's most helpful for scrutiny? You must want na. <laughs> application of the will. You must want. Oh, okay. I want to do it. I want to do it. Okay. What is most helpful for application of will? Zeal. Zeal actually has a very pleasant sensation. I'm so inspired. It's the idea is I'm so inspired. Then why would you be so inspired? Because you look at the teaching and there is a part in you that says feel correct. So you see, uh, you go backward. I, 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 I examine this teaching. It makes a lot of sense. Then you are inspired to start. Ma. You are inspired to start. Then you look at a bit deeper, right? You look a bit deeper, it gets you even more excited. Ma. You strive. I tell you, it's true. For my own personal experience, it's totally true. I come, I walk to this point really because of all the preceding seeing and understanding. Every time I see and understand a bit more, I get even more inspired to push on. It is true. The way he described it is absolutely correct. Every step of seeing gives you so much joy and so much confidence. You cannot but continue. And every time you continue, you will learn to mitigate and change more parts of your instincts, more parts of your habits. It's a very long process for those whose predecessors didn't do a good job. The process is easier for the ones who have set in place the right conditions. Now, we don't know what kind of conditions we have, right? We just do the next one a favor and do our part, okay? Don't just take away all his car, his teacher, to take away his teacher, take away his uh, whatever or her whatever, and then poor fellow comes into the world at the wrong place. Where are we born? Uh, in some, some village with no internet, <laughs> no access. But a very good brain. Because got learned the mama. Eh, they're very unhelpful. Eh? Okay, so what? So essentially, it's a it's a iterative process. You see, you apply, and then it goes on. Yeah. What is most helpful for reflective acceptance? Examination of the meaning. Ah. Examine it. Okay. You don't examine, you cannot, you cannot reflective understand, ma. Then what is helpful for examining? Memorizing. Lah. You don't memorize how to remember things. I mean, how, how to apply, how to examine. Four noble truth. Mm. We should come first, huh? Sensation first. Huh? Or say origin first. Huh? I don't know. Like, we should come first. <laughs> it's yeah, like all over the place. <laughs> hey, those those are the easier. Four noble truth is easy. I mean, easier is it's just four. You wait till he comes in with the 37 factors of enlightenment. Then you go, oh my gosh. Hey, which one comes first? Ah? You think I'm, I am strict? You all know Yen, right? You all know Dr. Lee, right? She's even more strict. When we were learning together, when we were learning together, I, my five agree is like, Rupa, mm, uh, consciousness, mm. then she, in sequence. Oh. Why? Five is five what? No, 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 no. You must remember in sequence. There is a reason for that. Okay, then I made it very scared of her, right? Made a point to memorize in sequence. Now I cannot forget. Sleep also cannot forget. But it's true. There is a reason for that flow. You got to learn that flow. Okay, memorizing. Don't hear memorize what? Don't read memorize what? Don't look through. Don't if you don't want to go for classes because it's so far. So far. It's so hot outside the one. Then read the sutta yourself. I don't want. Why? Ayah, tired lah. The book's so long. I'm like, forget it, forget it. It's over. This life's going to be over soon. <laughs> Leave it to the next one to handle. Don't take me seriously on that, okay? <laughs> so, give your, pay attention. You don't pay attention, can't hear. So, you see, it goes back to, you can't learn from someone you don't respect. Did you know that? Surely, right? You cannot learn from someone you don't respect. So you must respect the, the, the teacher. 
and then you must visit and you must have faith. Okay, done. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. So sudden, uh, the, suddenly the dog came out, right? Just faith, okay? We end with faith. Huh? Okay, this is any question. <laughs> because, because, I, I, I like the dog. I don't like dog very much. I like cats too. Yes, so don't keep looking at the dog. This is in questions. Any questions? Uh, Sister Bay, thank you very much for the talk. Uh. I think the talk is very elaborate. Uh. You see, from, from what I see, uh, what I see, uh, your context, uh, the whole context, uh, nobody here uh, can receive 100% information from you. Okay? The most, uh, the most, maybe about 50, 60%. I, I would say uh, to make it more engrossing, uh, I mean, after the talk, uh, maybe you can present in point form, uh, in point form so that you can take away those salient point form home. I, I can you do see? better. Okay. i give you a video. <laughs> <laughs> I repeated a few times the critical steps. I know what you're saying is that you ask us to memorize, we need, we need help to memorize. I'm mindful of that. Next time, we'll do that. But right now, here and now, can you remember some of the steps? You can. Enough? You can start from there. Okay? Any other question? <laughs> uh, can I? Can I just do a comment? Um, those are uh, reasoning, you know, reasoning, cogitation, reflective acceptance, right? Sometimes um, I do observe, uh, we only see what we want to see. So in, in the way we learn, we, we actually are selective. So the things that do not agree with us, we are actually blind to it. And in that way, a good point. Yeah, in true. that way, because of personal inclination, one arrives at the so-called truth at the wrong, wrong end. In a sense, it's how true. how do you guide against that? The individual must have that self awareness. That's why the Buddha started off by saying, "You got to be clear in your mind. How did you arrive at your conclusion?" Okay, you can't. You can guard against it only if you want to guard against it. Not everyone perceives that there is a need to guard against that. They can talk about it, like, well, we should all guard against it. But deep down, they may or may not have that instinct. So if you are sincere about wanting to build in yourself a certain habit to approach a topic with some caution. If you want to, if you say, I would like to guard against a habit to jump to conclusion or to see only what I want to see. I want to guard against it. I want to. Then you will constantly bear in mind, keep an open mind. You tell yourself that. By telling yourself that I must keep an open mind, which is what he said, Know for yourself how you come to conclusion. Then preserve the truth by saying, like acknowledge, keep yourself safe by saying, I believe in this, I came to conclusion like this, but this may not be it. Okay? So we are learning from the Buddha, his guidance. The way to do it, number one, tell yourself, how did I come to this conclusion? So you're examining examining yourself. How did I come to this conclusion? Now that I've come to this conclusion, I must remind myself, not yet. This may not be it. I need to keep an open mind so I can see more. I can understand more. Okay? I would like to ask what is regarding the four noble truths. If I do the reflection, do I have to do it in a set or I can do it separately? Good question. Yeah. Do you have, when you are reflecting on the noble truth, must it be done in a set or can it be taken separately? 
a la carte. <laughs> Almost be decastation, right? Sorry, can I come? It's because when I do the first noble truth, origin of suffering, uh, there was a kind of a bawa tanha ki. So. Thank you. It really depends on the condition. Okay. If you're seated and you just want to reflect on the dumb, on the noble truths, you can go ahead, reflect on like first, second, third, fourth. But if you happen, if something catches your attention, for instance, bawa tangha or whatever tangha, you see tangha, straight away, your mind must say there is a one thing somewhere. But in what? What is that one thing? And did you see tangha? Did you see bawa tangha or did you see dukkha? What's it? Which one did you see? Did you observe? Oh, we bawa. Ah, then you must look at we bawa tangha and what's the underpinning one thing. Beneath the we bawa, there's something else. Did you pay attention to that? Ah, okay. So if you experience we bawa means not bawa means becoming. We bower means not becoming. Okay, typically it's translated like that. Don't want re to be born again. But actually, it depends on the situation. If you are just dying, it's going to happen. Or you are so depressed, you want to take your own life. That's also we bower. But in the daily life, there will be days where you say, I don't want to think about this. I don't want to, I, 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 you don't want something unpleasant coming into your head. I don't want to think about it. And then you'll think about it. We bow, we bow. I don't think about it. I don't want to go there. People scold you. You want to repeat broadcast in there? You would like, you rather, you prefer to forget that you were scolded, right? You would prefer to forget an embarrassing event. But it keeps replaying in your mind. So as it's replaying, you're saying, I don't want this. We bower. I don't want that. So that's we bower tangha also. Okay. Yours is a literal one. That's the reflection of the first noble truth. Ah, okay. That was we bower. Now, the noble truths are actually the beginning and the end. The beginning and the end. The Dhamma starts with the noble truth. Ends with the noble truth. And if you look at the Buddha's life, huh? the first teaching he gave was Dhamma Chakra. Right? That's the Eightfold Path. The last teaching he gave in this life, the Eightfold Path. Okay? What's the Eightfold Path? Is mental cultivation. Changing, rewiring the way you see and understand something out there and in here. Actually, fundamentally, it's about understanding this one. Fundamentally, the Dhamma, right view, starts with Samaditi, right perspective. Fundamentally, it's about understanding this. Understanding this fellow's motivations and instincts and habits and drivers. And with the understanding correct, your mind leans, your thought formation will then lean in a certain way. Your understanding doesn't turn right and stays as per normal. I won't say, I, I, I'm being very careful here because I need you to understand this carefully. There is a right view and there is a world view. We typically will say there's a right view and there's a wrong view. But I will say there is a right view that is the Dhamma's view. And there is the and there's the world view, which is our habit. Our habit. And when that that view is essentially your baseline, your sanya, your perception. This is how it runs. And when your perception, your sanya, your baseline is at that level, in the worldly level, then the habits that we have 
is to win, to gain, to look good, to be better. What the Buddha called the eight vicissitudes of life. Pain, pleasure, win, losses, name, fame and infamy, blame and praise, you know, that eight of them. That's the thing you want. Your right view, you know, the, it is a right view, then after that right thought, right, right intention. Eh? That intention is the eight vicissitudes. For the regular person, for one not on the path, the mind constantly wants, seeks, prefer, don't want. When the mind gets into the state, it is the state of taking on, taking up. That is the habit of the mind is to take in. No nekama, nekama is to take out, let it be, let it go. Do you understand? I repeat, uh, the regular mind sitting on world, worldly view, worldly habits, Typically, there is a certain fixation with win and loss, uh, pleasure, pain, uh, looking good, not looking bad. You know, the, the mind leans that way. There is a habit there. And Nekama is allowing all these habits to go, to let be, allowing that to fade away. Instead of taking them all in and parking them here. Our mind parks a lot of things, park, parking them in here. Our mind parks a lot. And park and park until on an average day, if you look at your own mind, it has a lot of shows for you to watch. The regular mind talks a lot, right? If you see, if, even for us practitioners, if you sit and you watch the mind, you will see that it's running a uh, it's it's running twenty four seven or maybe twenty let me see twenty seventeen hours not twenty four seventeen actually at night when you sleep it's still running it comes out in dream that's all uh, but it, it it keeps running and it runs a lot because you are taking in a lot you are actually packing a lot away the renunciation that the Buddha talks about, the letting go, right? It's, it, what it means is you don't pack it in anymore. You look at it and you say it's not important. You look at it and you go, it's okay. What people say, it's okay. Sometimes people don't even say anything. They're busy talking about themselves. But in your mind, they're all saying me. In your mind, you see, in our mind. We have a form to preserve. We have to face a preserve. We have identity to preserve. There is all these we have to. All those are the opposite of Nekama. We take on. So Nekama, renunciation. Typically, people think, oh, it's the big one. No, it's the little ones, the very little ones. Daily, moment to moment, let the world be in here so you can enjoy the here now you can enjoy the here and now only if it is not going around building the past the future the distance the comparison the desires actually there's a lot a lot that the mind is building you don't believe me you just look, sit down there should I sit like this? Should I sit like that? Uh, like that? Should I touch this way? Touch that way? Uh, all this have really. Should I be doing this? Should I be doing that? But we don't allow it to just rest. So when the Buddha talks about examining the body and looking at body and all, all, it's not just the body, it's the body with the mind. It's just looking at the mind and seeing how the drivers drive the conditions of the mind. Okay? Okay, after this. <laughs> oh, okay, yes.
I will still hang around for another five ten minutes. If you want to, 